You've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it. But you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast, where our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Now, our guest for this week's show is real estate expert and fund manager, Danny Kalinov. Now, Danny is the founder and principal and fund manager for Diversus Fund. Now, since 1999, Daniel has analyzed, purchased, and repositioned a large variety of income producing real estate assets. Diversus was born out of Daniel's frustration with the volatility of the stock market and the realization that relying on stocks alone for stability in retirement was largely a game of chance. And so, guys, I'm excited to have Danny here with us today. And so, without further ado, Danny, welcome to the show. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing awesome, Kevin. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining. And, uh, you know, we've had a lot of good fun discussions here before we started recording. And um, and so, I, I you know, I gave you a, a brief. The, the, the folks, a brief overview of your background. I mean, really, really sure. There's lots of cracks that I'd like you to fill in. And so before we dive into some of the discussions we were having here before we hit the record button, please, Danny, if you would take a few moments, tell us a little bit more about yourself, your background, and, and ultimately how you found your way into this, uh, this real estate world. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, maybe as you can tell by my name, uh, I'm Russian by origin. So I came to the United States as a little kid. Uh, I was about five years old. My mom came here as a single mother uh, with a suitcase and a five-year-old, 200 bucks and not really knowing the language. Uh, she worked her tail off for the next 20 years, kind of climbing the corporate ladder from uh, basically janitor to executive vice president of a Fortune 500 uh, company flying to business meetings on a private jet. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that was a long, arduous road. And along that path, um, you know, she was following the classic prescription for success in America, which is put your head down, work hard, you know, set aside, maximize your 401k, set aside some money in the market. And then one day when you're ready to hang up your spurs, uh, just sit back and collect mailbox money. <laughs> and, uh, Unfortunately, when she was ready to retire, that was right when the dot-com uh, bust hit, the dot-com crash, and she lost almost 50% of her uh, entire nest egg. And she didn't really understand why. Her, her advisor had put her into some bad, um, some bad investments, and she was very confused and frustrated, and as was I. And, um, you know, I looked around. I was just uh, getting out of undergrad in the late 90s, and I kind of realized that the majority of folks have their futures invested in assets that they don't understand and increasingly can't really control. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have a lot of younger folks post COVID during peri COVID sitting at home, you know, um, trading out of their Robin hood accounts. And honestly, you know, while those are asset classes that I think probably deserve a smaller percentage of the average American's portfolio in terms of their risk profile, I think one of the things that was great about that whole movement, that whole, um, that whole evolution is that for the first time ever, you now have people taking a much more active role in managing their own financial future. And that was simply the impetus for our fund. We wanted to scour the world for um, interesting um, high beta real estate deals that allow people to take a little portion of their either uh, disposable income or their retirement savings and put them into things that they understand and that they can call up a fund manager and say, hey, how's that property doing? What's going on with that deal? That's extremely important. And that's whether you're a teacher making 35K a year or a heart surgeon making uh, 535K a year, of which we have both in our fund. Um, people need to play a more active role and our job is to help them do that. Fantastic. I, I appreciate that, Danny. And tell me a little bit more about, you know, the asset selection. Uh, Diverse is fun. I know that there's a few key asset types that, that you guys absolutely love uh, that you spend most of your focus in. And so maybe give us a little bit more insight there as to uh, kind of where you guys play ball. Yeah, Kevin, that's a great question. Um, and really, so our fundamental thesis is that we are not 
geniuses of any kind. We don't have any secret or hidden information that you know anybody else doesn't have. And so what we do is we just follow uh, Wayne Gretzky's advice, which is skate to where the puck is going, not to where it is. And when you look around the economy and you look at it you know, from 30,000 feet, we see two huge tidal wave trends that are coming down the pike that are 100% undeniable. The first one is the retirement of the baby boomers, right? It's the, it's the biggest socioeconomic shift in the history of the world as we know it. You have in the US alone, 77 million people, but globally close to half a billion people who are on the verge of you know, coming home, hanging up their spurs and being done with their working years. Mm-hmm. And so when you look at what's important to those people, which we do by following the AARP closely, while things like healthcare, spending time with family, um, you know, other uh, other important items make the list. One of the most important things that those folks say is, "I want to go enjoy my life. I want to have fun." And when you drill down into what does that actually mean, really, it comes down to travel, getting out there and experiencing the world. And a true testament to this is the absolute meteoric explosion in the RV industry. So we're not in the RV industry, but um, hospitality, particularly in our case, uh, short-term rentals and boutique hotels are at one end of our um, portfolio because we really think that over the next 20 years, lots of baby boomers and incidentally their kids as well who follow them around like a comet tail following the comet are going to be checking out super cool parts of the country, super cool parts of the world that they can access easily. Uh, where they know the language. And so we're laying down roots in those areas. We manage a significant vacation rental portfolio in Southern California, particularly in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And we helped finance the largest hotel in the country of Belize, which is a former British Commonwealth, English speaking, and less than four hour flight from um, the majority of the United States. And we're, we're working on our second project there right now. Uh, so we really believe very strongly in hospitality, particularly in curated hospitality that is focused more on providing an experience than just a, you know, 300 square foot box to lay your head in, which is what uh, most typical hotels do. On the other side of the spectrum, you have, unfortunately, the stratification of the American socioeconomic structure, which is that the middle class is getting smaller and the upper, the upper classes and the lower classes are getting larger. And so um, we're focusing, you know, on the one hand on hospitality and boutique hospitality, which is not inexpensive. That is, you know, when you're charging people a thousand bucks a night, uh, there's only a certain caliber of folks that can afford to participate in that kind of experience. On the flip side, you have more and more people, uh, and I think COVID brought this to bear more than anything, that are looking to maximize the amount of uh, habitable living space that they have on a fixed monthly budget. So if you have 500 bucks a month to spend on housing and your choices are a, you know, 800 square foot apartment somewhere in the outskirts of, uh, you know, middle America or living in a, uh, you know, a, a single family structure like a mobile home with a little bit of a yard and uh, some space for the kids to run around. We feel, as I'm sure you can attest, because you're the expert uh, in, in the mobile home park world, that that is an asset class that is going to be extremely well positioned uh, over the next decade or so. To um, you know, to, to accommodate the growing number of folks who find their income and their purchasing power being squeezed. So, uh, long story short, we're in short-term rentals and hospitality, and affordable housing on the other end of the spectrum. No, I love every bit of that. And yeah, as you know, we are definitely in the mobile home park space. Love every bit of, of that business. So we can definitely. I'd like to chat about that a little bit. But before we go there, we'd love to to talk about the short-term rental side of of your business. And I do believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Danny. That's that's kind of where you got your start uh, coming out of school, right? That's that's where you really uh, dipped your toe first and foremost was in the short-term rental space, correct? Yeah, you got it, man. Um, so I went to I went to school in Boston and uh, uh, undergrad and grad school, and uh, I had just proposed to my wife before we left because I figured, you know, if I'm gonna up and leave, I was living in Denver and take my wife to Boston for two years. I got I got to show some commitment here. So 
I proposed, we got engaged, I took her out there. It was two of the coldest winters on record. Uh, it was just <laughs> like, it was just butt cold every day. And she was like, look, man, I don't care where you get a job or what you do, as long as it's in San Diego. That's all I care about. And I was like, all right, no problem. I, I can, I think I can, I can work with that. So we came to San Diego, which uh, is self-proclaimed as America's finest city. You know, it's 72 degrees, it's sunny, it's got, you know, a lot of culture, a lot of, it's just got all the ingredients of a, of a great, great city. And we showed up and um, like many people, we accidentally fell into the uh, vacation rental space. And, you know, we don't really call it vacation rentals anymore because it now services a br much broader market. There's so many more people than just vacationers. Um which we could maybe touch on later, but we uh, ended up buying our first home, which was a duplex. Uh, we lived on the top floor and our friends rented on the bottom floor. It was about uh, 1,800 square feet up top, 1,200 square feet down below. And this is like 2008. So Airbnb wasn't even a word then. That was like the year that Airbnb essentially, I think, incorporated. Yeah, I was going to say, um, when, when, when was Airbnb founded? It, it, well, the guys, Brian Chesky and his, and his buddies, I think they, they, they started renting out rooms like in 06, but Airbnb gotcha. was founded and became a company right in that same year in 2008. Um, so, you know, it was extremely nascent stages. We were, we were only using VRBO and, uh, and just, well, just to back up a second. So our, our, our friend was paying like two grand a month for uh, 1200 square feet facing the water. So nice water view, lived below us, could kind of hear footsteps upstairs. He moved out and we were like, you know what? We're about to have a kid pretty soon. Why don't we try to short-term this thing so that when mom and dad, grandma and grandpa come to town, they can stay in the lower unit when they need it. And so it was mostly out of necessity. And we threw this thing up on Airbnb and we found out that it, we were getting 1500 bucks a week which was, you know, three quarters of what we were getting a month. And within the first two months of listing it, we were pretty much 80% booked <laughs> for the rest of the year. Wow. Um, we, were, we were getting checks because back then there wasn't really digital processing. So people were sending in checks. We were leaving keys under the door. It was very unsophisticated. But um, my wife and I looked at each other and we were like, man, if we could just do this like 20 more times or even 10 more times, we could get out of the rat race, you know? Um, and, and so that's what we started doing. I mean, we both had corporate jobs. We both worked in the medical space, but on the side, we were buying up duplexes and triplexes um, and turning them into vacation rentals. Hmm. And, uh, and eventually we ran out of our own money as, uh, as you know, happens to, you know, uh, it happens sometimes, especially in Southern California, when you're looking at, um, you know, a million bucks a pop, but um our network was folks who were pretty much, you know, high net worth, um, even other folks who, you know, had, had, had modest net worths, but wanted to participate in that, in that game. And they, they saw what we were doing and they were like, wow, how do we get in this? And, you know, I decided to uh, leave corporate America and learn how to raise capital professionally, how to do it the right way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so from there, the fund was born and, and, and we just started using other people's money to, um, uh, purchase, rehab, and market short-term rentals, and um, the rest of the history grew from there. Good deal. Uh, have you found it difficult? Uh, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, Southern California. You know, prices, you know, million plus dollars uh, for a typical, you know, t typical maybe the typical home that you would have bought maybe 10, 15 years ago. That's that's the price point today. Is it still a feasible and viable business model? Um, in, in let's you know, speak to San Diego where you're based out of, can you still purchase a single family or duplex triplex in a desirable location? And, you know, based on what it might fetch from a short term rental perspective, can the numbers work? Yeah. So that's a world-class question. Um, I think to, to, let's take a step back and ask that question from a regular long-term rental perspective. I think from a long-term rental perspective, the numbers absolutely don't make any sense mm -hmm. um, unless you're okay with, you know, a, a three cap, 3% yield or thereabouts. Um, so absolutely one of the worst places I think to get into the real estate business. If you're a buy and hold traditional single family uh, investor, from a short-term rental perspective, uh, the numbers absolutely can work, but 
the issue now is the regulatory environment, mm -hmm. right? So I think if you're going to be a short-term rental investor uh, nationwide, the number one question um, is, well, I would say it's tied for market and team, right? So if you could find a market that's friendly towards that business model and will allow you to own more than one. Uh, so for example, right now, San Diego just passed new legislation that says, um, you know, there's going to be a lottery system. So you got to put your name in a hat and you may or may not get a license to operate. And by the way, there can only be one short term rental per social security number. Oh so so if you're, if you're a husband, wife team, you know, you guys, um, may or may not each win the lottery, but if you do the, the maximum number of properties that you can have is two. Wow. So. Yeah, I want to I want to speak to that because I mean I was going to ask you you know what are the biggest risks and that's where I was going with that question but you brought it up you beat me to the punch um, as far as your the risk of regulatory changes and you know you're kind of in the heart of it you know, I guess first and foremost speaking to San Diego what was the catalyst for them to pass this new legislation I mean what, what was the problem that they saw that they're trying to trying to solve. So I think it's really two things. The first one is um, neighborhood integrity. So uh, when, when, when the industry is completely unregulated, uh, there's always going to be a handful of bad actors who don't really, um, you know, they're not good stewards of the neighborhood, right? They, they don't respect that. And really what that comes down to is vetting your guests. So if you're constantly having um, bachelor parties and loud rocket affairs, uh, nobody's going to want to live next to that. And of course, they're going to uh, do whatever they can to uh, insist on regulation. So I think in our, with our company, which is called um, Rental with a View, because all of our properties uh, have a view, that, that's the mandatory kind of common thread. The number one thing I would say that has driven our success is our ability to get good people in the door. And, you know, not everybody follows that same prescription and it's pissed off a lot of people, understandably. Mm -hmm. Um, the second thing is affordable housing. Uh, I think that this is a weaker argument, but a lot of people make it, which is that um, by taking up uh, inventory in a, a, as a large percentage of the housing stock that's available, you are uh, preventing people from being able to afford a house in, in that market. So the response of the vacation rental industry to that argument is that, well, hey guys, these are million dollar you know, homes that for the most part, would not really play in the affordable housing space um, if and when they become long-term rentals or if and when you take them out of the short-term rental pool, um, they go into the long-term rental pool. Those are not going to provide housing stock for the types of folks that you're trying to help out anyway. Right. You know, um, but, but, but those are the two main arguments. It, interesting. So, what are some of the markets that you're focused on today in the short-term rental space? I mean, I'm assuming that, you know, that, that poses a challenge for you expanding your portfolio in San Diego. And so talk to me about some of the other parts of the country where you guys have found great success with the short-term rental model. Yeah. So, so we're, we're largely still focused on Southern California. Um, okay. what, what, what's interesting though, is that uh, it's, it's, it's a highly fragmented uh, space from the regulatory perspective. So it's, it's county by county. And in some cases it's city by city. Hmm. So, so this is the, this is the, the city of San Diego passing these, these rules. Now, if you go a hundred miles to the West, uh, you know, to Palm Springs, for example, um, or to the Coachella Valley, uh, there's completely different rules. Like even, even the town of Indio, which is where Coachella, the Coachella festival takes place, mm -hmm. their regulations are much more lax than neighboring Palm Springs. These are two cities that are side by side, you know, within a very short proximity to one another that have fundamentally different philosophies towards the role of short-term rentals in their housing stock. Hmm. So, um, so we're playing all over Southern California uh, within different cities because we just feel like, you know, it's kind of, you know, live where you want to live, but invest where the numbers make sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, right now we feel like there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of economies of scale by having our team uh, centered in the same location. But uh, we know, I mean, tons of operators that are just absolutely killing it, you know, in the Southeast, in your neck of the woods, uh, you know, Destin, Florida, obviously, mm -hmm. I mean, all over Florida, um, you know, just the Apple, the whole Appalachian range, Nashville, um, places where you can get a house for, you know, three, 400 grand, 
And, um, you know, the funny thing is that when, when you have a three bedroom home, the difference in nightly rental rate, you know, is, is not that much between a, a coastal property and maybe a more inland property um, to justify the difference in the acquisition price of the asset. Hmm. So, you know, the amount that you're, if you pay five times less in Nashville for the exact same home, you're not going to get five times more in San Diego for that same home. So, um, yeah, I know, that makes sense. I guess the only, maybe the one of the only big uh, shifts there would be the seasonality of maybe a Nashville versus a San Diego. San Diego is fairly beautiful year round, whereas Nashville has a cold season, right? Where, where maybe it, it might not be as trafficked by tourists uh, going there in November, whereas San Diego is probably still booming in November. I, I don't know if I'm correct or not with that statement, but that, that, that would be my guess. Yeah, you totally are, man. I mean, so it's, it's, there's a seasonality to it. And um, if, if your cost of capital, if your basis is low, right, then you can afford to make, let's say 80% of your net income in, let's say six months out of the year, and, and be, you know, not lose a not lose a minute of sleep during the six months where things are a little bit quiet. Right. Um, But if you got a big nut to cover, like in a coastal town, then you got to make sure that you're putting heads in beds <laughs> year round. Yeah, sure, sure. So back when you guys started your short-term rental portfolio or started buying short-term rentals, you know there there weren't re- there weren't any p- property management uh, companies that had a specific specialty of short-term rentals, right? I, maybe there were a few here and there, but like that, it was such a new niche within the industry that it just really didn't exist. I mean, it's it's a very different model. It's more akin to that of a of a hotel, uh, as far as like, you know, the amount of turns than that of a long-term, you know, annual rental, which is very typical with uh, the type of housing we're, we're speaking to. However, you know, this trend is booming and, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a legitimate asset class now. And so for folks that are looking to get into this business, uh, that are looking to grow a portfolio such as you have done, Danny, on the short-term rental space, what are some of those challenges of scaling? Is, is, it, is, is one of the big ones still finding an adequate property management company that, uh, that specializes in the short-term type of rentals, again, which have a significant number of turns you know, in comparison to that of a, again, normal annual rental? Is that one of the big challenges still or is that no longer one? Yeah, that's another great question. So uh, earlier I was saying there's, there's two key considerations that I would look at um, before making this investment. The first one is market and the second one is team. And by team, property management is exactly what I was referring to. So, you know, if you're going to buy in a outside market that's outside of where you live and where you can lay eyes on things, you absolutely need to do a, you know, rigorous vetting of the property management company. Because um, to your point, that that that's that niche um has has just developed over the last let's say five years Mm -hmm. and it's a combination it's it's a really interesting skill set because on the one hand in terms of the operations uh you're exactly right it's very bricks and mortar it's very operationally intensive you're not only running a hotel but you're you're running a hotel that doesn't really have a lot of economies of scale because the rooms aren't all in one building right so so whereas you know one property may have the linens and the little shampoo bottles and all the extra amenities you know stored in the uh, in the basement storage, the property right down the street has them you know up in the attic storage or whatever. <laughs> so so every single house has its own unique peculiarities um, in terms of maintenance and cleaning, and um, with the uh, like like now that we're coming out of COVID, I mean, the post pandemic surge in demand for this product has been, uh, I mean, unprecedented. We have mm-hmm. a zero vacancy at our port in our portfolio for the next four months. Wow. And what that means is a ton of same day check-ins and checkouts. So uh, our checkout time is 10 AM. Our check-in time is 4 PM. So that gives our cleaning crew six hours to completely turn over, you know, um, like, many, 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 many units. Um, And so if there's one thing wrong, I mean, if a guest knocked the TV off the wall or broke a lamp or whatever it is, that problem needs to be addressed in that six hour window. You also have the operational um, demands of just having so many people staying at these homes. 
if they don't know how to turn on the TV at two in the morning, or if the smoke alarm is going off because the battery is dead or all the dumb, crazy things that happen <laughs> right in the hospitality business, you need to have an infrastructure on the ground that can support that. And, and that would be, th those would be my first questions for any property management company, you know, Hey, what do you do if a guest calls and says that they just saw like two cockroaches scurrying across the floor? How do you guys, <laughs> how do you guys answer that question? You know what I mean? So, so questions like that, just based on the thing, you know, I would, I would encourage people to think about the things that have happened to them on vacation and make a list of those issues and ask your property management company, how do they handle that? Mm -hmm. The other side of the property management coin is the marketing piece, right? So getting your listings um, on to the major listing sites and then having them rank high in the results list, because there's so many options now that, you know, the 80, 20 rule, I mean, Pareto's principle could not be more applicable than in the short-term rental space. 20% of the listings are generating 80% of the revenue. Hmm. And that is a function of the, of the listing companies, you know, getting smarter about how they display results. So Expedia recently bought HomeAway and VRBO, and they now display results based on the same yield management algorithm that they use to display hotels, which is very simple. The ones that book the best are the ones that are going to get shown first. Mm -hmm. So, so you have to make sure that your property manager, if you're paying them to do the marketing for you also has the software and tech, you know, technological pr prowess to make sure that they're constantly showing up, ranking high and putting heads in beds. Um, so those two things combined, which is like a knowledge of the digital world and then a knowledge of the physical world are what it takes to be a great property manager these days. And honestly, we were not finding that resource. So we had to build our own. And, and so we manage all of our own properties as well as some properties for other owners slash investors, just because, um, we couldn't find anybody that, that met our standards, not to say that that, that company doesn't exist today. Uh, I'm sure they do, but we built it from the ground up, uh, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think no one's ever going to care for your property as much as you do, right? Like I, I it just, it does, it doesn't work, right? You'll never have an absolute direct alignment of interest when you've got a third party overseeing your asset. So I, someone can argue with me to the sun goes down. I mean, but that's just the case. It just, it is what it is. That's not saying you can't find a very uh, proficient property management company that will do a, you know, a stellar job, but it's probably not going to be with the care and the love um, that you might have for your very own asset. I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Danny, it's a, there's a, a national firm. And I, again, I'm not, I'm not too privy to this, this space. I've stayed in many VRBOs, many Airbnbs, but I'm not too privy to the management side of this business. Are there, are there national management companies that specialize in vacation rentals? I, I, one comes to mind. I, I feel like I've seen advertisements for it. Um, does that ring a bell? Yeah, there absolutely are. That's becoming a huge business. Um, and uh, I mean, I'll put in a plug for, for uh, the one that I've worked with, which is turnkey vacation rentals. Okay. Um, that may be the one that you've seen, but there's, there's others out there. Um, TJ and his team do a great job, but like you said, I mean, you know, it's um, it's the, what's a good comparison. I mean, it's, it's the Ferrari Testarossa or the Ferrari F40, right? Versus the Honda Accord. And there's nothing wrong with the Honda Accord. I mean, it's, it's a great car for the masses. And I think all you have to understand is that if you go with a national company that you are going to be put into, you know, a very, very large portfolio and they'll probably do a really good job on the marketing side because they have a ton of, um, uh, marketing muscle, uh, mm -hmm. with the major listing sites just because of their sheer volume. But, when it comes to boots on the ground, you know, it, it all comes down to humans, you know, it's just humans dealing with humans. Sure. Um, and so, so that's the part of the, of the puzzle that you really want to make sure that you're getting, you're getting as much mind share as the next property and hopefully even more. So I wouldn't discourage people from using one of those companies. I would just have the understanding that, you know, you're going to maybe do 70%, 80% as well as if you cared for it yourself. Yeah, no, no, agreed. And I, we've spent a lot of time here on vacation rentals, but I, I definitely want to take a deep dive. I know this is uh, this is where you got your your feet initially wet. You built a portfolio out of vacation rentals. You still believe in this asset class, and you, you kind of got started on the ground floor when it wasn't really a thing. Now it's a huge 
you know, a huge niche in our, in our, in our big real estate world. And um, so again, I didn't mean to spend, you know, the, almost the entirety of the show on that, but it's, I think it's important to discuss and, um, and, and you're an expert in that space. So with that being said, I know that aside from vacation rentals, uh, or, or I guess, you know, short-term rentals is, is the better, uh, uh, you know, key phrase for that or description. You guys are also in the, you know, the hotel space. Um, I, I believe you had said that you're building your very first hotel. So maybe speak to that, that niche a little bit, exactly, um, you know, location of the hotel, uh, kind of uh, key attributes of the hotel, and ultimately what drove you guys to that sector? Because again, it's got similarities to long-term rentals, but also it's, it's its own living, breathing animal. It's, it's got variances as well. So if you could maybe divulge a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the first hotel project we did was just as a uh, financier. We, we raised a bunch of capital for a project in Belize, which ultimately became um, the Hilton at Mahogany Bay Village. It's um, by far the biggest resort and beach club uh, and hotel at all in the country of Belize. And um, I, I first visited Belize in 1999, the same year I started uh, started investing in real estate. Um, and it's an amazing country. And I think that um, having, you know, an international bent to your investing strategy is extremely important, whether that is through stocks, um, you know, ETFs, mutual funds, whatever it is, um, but for sure real estate as well, because, um, you know, there is for sure, I think a real estate bubble right now in the United States. I was just, you know, reading an article about how, uh, um, you know, the, the median home price is higher than it's been, uh, you know, since the 70s, uh, as far as affordability for the average median income. And uh, the fact of the matter is that that's not happening everywhere. There are still places in the world where equity can happen. And, you know, we certainly don't want to buy for appreciation, right? We want to invest for cash flow. Um, but I think, you know, you would be hard pressed to say, hey, I'm going to buy a place right now, pretty much anywhere in the country and expect uh, some aggressive appreciation assumption to materialize. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at other markets where Americans have, have said they're interested in going, um, whether that is on a short-term vacation or for retirement. Um, and again, this really comes back to that thesis of skate to where the puck is going. Mm -hmm. So when you look around and you say like, well, where are Americans going? Well, they're going to places that are close by, that are safe, that have good weather and where they can speak the language, right? Because 91% of Americans, you know, don't speak anything but American. <laughs> and, 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 and that's, and that's just a, that's just a, you know, that's just a fact. There's nothing, you know, I'm not, I'm just joking or I'm saying it tongue in cheek, but when, when you show up at a destination and you hear your own language and you can use your own money, but you realize like, wow, I could live here very comfortably on three grand a month. Um, that's a very interesting thing. Um, and it used to be that that was only for baby boomers. But again, I mean, COVID has spurred the, um, you know, the mobile work economy. And so just like we don't call vacation rentals vacation rentals anymore, because we had so many guests that were just working remotely for like a month at a time because their companies allowed them to do so. I think that's a trend that's not going away. And so when you look at that and you say, all right, people are people are traveling to places that they want to go and have great experiences. Then you kind of say, well, how do I participate in that? And the best way that we found is through ownership of, um, of unique hospitality assets. Mm -hmm. And so a hotel, a kind of, you know, it, it is a hotel, um, the, the one that we invested in. And, um, but if you look at it, it's really a, uh, it's an amalgamation of little cottages. And so when you get there, it feels like um, something much more bespoke, something much more quaint. It is not a huge, you know, 10 story brick building. It's, it's a little one and two story wooden cottages. Um, and, and, and those are the types of projects that we're doing. So that hotel has been up and running for two years now. It weathered the COVID storm. Um, we're, you know, getting back into cash flow positive territory, um, you know, hopefully going to be returning some proceeds to our investors soon. And, and now we're on our second project there, um, as well as, you know, some other Central American uh, countries. I can't really get too much into that right now, but we want to, you know, we want to try to get some economies of scale by building um, fun, quirky, cool assets that are amalgamated in a single space. And I guess mm -hmm. they're under the moniker of hotel, but they're really... They're, they're really places that people could either retire to or use as, 
a lifestyle investment that, um, that they enjoy while they're there, but then that pays them when they're not. Right. And, and that's the tough thing is a lot of people have this dream of retiring to this, you know, magical place, um, where they can kick back and sit Mai Tais on the beach. But right now they're maybe still in the middle of their working years. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're like, how do I get into this, this trend? How do I, you know, how do I get into this game of musical chairs? Because I know that the baby boomers, like every year, there's going to be more and more and more people that are out there looking for the same stuff that I'm looking for. And we want to provide that asset, right? We want to figure out a way to let, you know, Kevin, you and your family go on this amazing vacation to this killer destination for two weeks out of the year, but get some mailbox money the other 50 weeks. Um, and, and that's kind of what we're doing. So it's the same concept as mm -hmm. what we're doing in the US, uh, but on a bigger scale and where there's a little bit more uh, equity value in the underlying asset. Got it. Got it. Love every bit of that. And, you know, as I'd mentioned, uh, I really wanted to talk to mobile home parks, but Danny, we might have to have a separate show for that because we're, we're basically <laughs> no out of time. No, no, seriously. No I think I think I'd love to invite you back for another show to to really dive a little deeper into that side of the business. We we spend a lot of time on short term rentals and then also some of these um, you know, hotel or boutique hotel projects that you guys have going on. And ultimately would love to spend some more time with you. But with that being said, Danny, for those that want to learn more about um, Diversus Fund and, and what you guys have going on, where's the best place to find you and reach out to you? Yeah, sure. So our website is diversusfund.com. That's uh, D-I-V-E-R-S-U-S, uh, which is uh, the old school Latin to uh, be different, to move in an opposite direction, which is what we try to do is zig when other people are zagging. Um, so diversusfund.com. You can email me directly at daniel at diversusfund.com. Uh, you can also check out rentalwithaview.com, uh, which is our short-term rental portfolio. And we'll, uh, you know, find us on all the interwebs, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, all that good stuff. And we'd be happy to answer any questions for uh, anybody interested in any of these spaces or potentially investing in any of these asset classes. All righty. Fantastic. Well, Danny, thanks for joining us, my friend. And again, I'll reach out to you and we'll schedule another time, get you back on here and actually finish up our conversation. But it's been a pleasure having you here. Pleasure has been all mine. Thank you so much, Kevin. Really appreciate it. All righty, guys. That's all we have for this week's show. So until we meet again next week, this is your host, Kevin Bupp, wishing you huge success. Take care. Congratulations. Now you've got more of the best tricks of the trade in building massive amounts of passive income from real estate. For more amazing resources, visit realestateinvestingforcashflow.com. And we'll see you next Monday morning.